I'm in the beautiful Acadia National Park in Maine, and I'm continuing my series on switching cameras. I'm choosing between the Nikon Z9, the Sony Alpha 1, and the Canon R5, and I already have a first video out explaining all of that, so you can check that out if you want. Today, in this video, I'm gonna be covering traveling and also landscape photography and how each one of these cameras measures up. We're gonna be talking about the overall weight, ergonomics, ease of use, features, portability, durability, weatherproof ability, and much, much more. Maybe you've been thinking about switching cameras or buying some new gear, getting a new lens, and this is a great time for me to mention my sponsor, KEH, because they can make that happen so easily. And this month in April, they're honoring Earth Month. Because when you recycle your gear by selling it or by buying used, you're doing a good thing for yourself by saving money, but also for the planet by keeping this old gear working and in circulation. And KEH fixes everything, keeps it in working order and working perfectly. So if you're looking for a new camera and you want to sell your old one or buy a new one, go to KEH. You can get 5% off anything you buy using our coupon code down below or you can get a 5% bonus for anything you sell using our code down below. Thank you, KEH, so much. I've got the R5 on me now and I'm shooting with it. But before we get into anything more here, let's cut back to yesterday when I actually packed up all of my gear and figured out what everything weighed. One thing I consider with my travel gear is how it will feel to actually travel with it. I'm gonna put this tiny backpack on my tiny back and then be very discerning about what deserves a spot in there. For that reason, I've taken each system and I've lined up the lenses that I'm going to bring and I've weighed everything to see which is the heaviest, which is going to be the most cumbersome. And so the first one that I did was the Nikon Z9. This is the largest looking because it has this built-in grip and we also see that in the weight. This system is 147 ounces, 9.18 pounds. And that's the Z9, the 70 to 200 F2.8, uh, the 24 to 70 F2.8, and I don't own it and have it with me, but the 14 to 24 F2.8, I put that one's weight in there just to see what it would be like if I had the full system. Next, we have the Canon R5, and we have just about the same lenses, the comparable lenses. We have the 70 to 200 F2.8, we have the 15 to 35 F2.8, and then the 24 to 70 F2.8. And the Canon comes in at 124 ounces, that's 7.75 pounds. That's about a pound and a half lighter, which might not sound significant, but like I said, my tiny backpack on my tiny back, hiking around for hours, it's surely going to make a difference. And then lastly, I measured the weights of everything on the A1, and this one came in at 117 ounces total, 7.3 pounds. So this is the lightest system. It looks the lightest, it looks the smallest, and it is. We're here at Sandy Beach in Arcadia National Park, and we're going to be taking some sunrise pictures, hopefully. There's a lot of cloud coverage, but maybe the sun will poke through. One of the reasons I'm considering the Alpha One, even though I'm not a sports photographer, is because it's a good versatile camera. So it's got a really high resolution. It's got the 50 megapixels, but it's also small and easy to travel with and versatile. You can shoot portraits. I'll be shooting wildlife with it as well if this is the camera that I choose. And the design is really nice. Sony redesigned the menu system, so it's more intuitive now. Uh, it's the type of thing where if you're going into the menus, 
sometimes there can be a lot of options and that's a good or bad thing depending on if you're the type of person who wants to highly customize your camera or if you want things to just be more no fuss, no options. I like having some options. One thing I'm noticing is you cannot go wrong with any of these cameras. They're all great, but depending on your preferences, you're probably gonna lean towards one of the three systems. And one thing that I like is that the Alpha One is the lightest system and my arms are getting tired on this hike. I've been walking around for about an hour and it's getting a little bit heavy. So I think that might make a difference for me. I know people think these videos are like staged, but I actually don't know which camera I'm going to choose. But I just had this moment where I went back to the R5 that I've been shooting with. And I love that the touchscreen has the little exposure compensation on there. The menus are easy to access. I feel like the usability is really good. Every time I think I know which one, another one pulls me in with some feature that I love. There's so many things to love about the Canon R5 as a travel and landscape camera. First of all, it's the least expensive of these three options. At about $4,000 it comes in, about $1,000 to $2,000 less expensive than the Z9 and the Alpha One. And it's also compact and light. It's as light as the Alpha One. They have these new RF lenses that are more compact uh, and lighter, which is nice when you're packing up your bag. Another thing I love is this fully articulating screen because I can tilt it to see when I'm taking landscape pictures if I want to hold the camera low, but I can also completely flip it around to see myself if I want to take a quick video of myself. For the other two cameras, I'd have to bring a separate camera or a field monitor if I wanted to see myself to make sure that the shot was good. Uh, another thing is that like the other cameras, it has high resolution like you'd want in a landscape camera. It's got 45 megapixels. They all have two card slots, but the Canon has an SD card. The SD card is nice because this is a less expensive option and it's more readily available. So I get a huge card and I just keep it in my camera the whole trip as backup, a second backup after I load them into my computer. My computer also has an SD card slot and SD card readers are easier to find than these special cards. So I like having both options. Tony's not mic'd up, but he's saying the CF Express B cards are great for sports because they're reading your files faster, but you don't need that for a landscape. So having the SD card, you're not gonna notice that it's slower and you're gonna have more storage. It's gonna be less expensive. It's gonna be easier to find an SD card reader, especially if you're traveling and you tend to forget things like me. Speaking of saving on weight or forgetting things, all three cameras are capable of doing USB charging. So you can just bring a cord instead of a big charger and that makes that process easier. One thing none of them have that I would really like is anti-theft technology. And that's why I only have one or actually two of the cameras on me right now. I didn't want to be standing around with a huge amount of gear. I felt too vulnerable, especially now that my friends are being robbed and things. I do have an Apple AirTag on it right here, discreetly clipped onto my straps. And this just means that if I forget it somewhere, my phone will tell me that I forgot it. Maybe a thief won't notice and I'll be able to track them down quickly. It's not really great anti-theft tech, but it's, it's all I have right now. So I would really love if camera companies put that in there. Then I'd have all three cameras lined up right here. I think people are gonna to wanna to hear a lot about image quality. There's good news and unexciting news. It's pretty much a wash. All three cameras are great. They're all super high resolution. They all have sharp glass. You, you can't go wrong. I don't think you're gonna be able to really tell the difference with the images, but the difference will be in other little details in the cameras, the weight, the features, the ergonomics, uh, the tilt screen if you need it to film yourself. That's something that I will really want. The memory cards if you want to have the SD card option. Um, and then the glass, the size of the lens is available. And so those are all the things we're going to go through. But I, I don't think you can go wrong. <laughs>
The Z9 is coming in in the middle when it comes to price. It's $5,500, the R5 is $4,000, the Alpha One is $6,500. This is fully capable, like I talked about before, great resolution, great lenses, um, and I thought that the size would hold it back when it came to landscape, but it, I haven't really noticed it mattering. So this is the largest, the heaviest. You can see it's got this built-in battery um, and that makes it the most cumbersome. But when it comes to landscape, it doesn't bother me. Where it will bother me is in general travel. If you're just more casually traveling and you plop this on the table when you're eating with your family or something, it's pretty substantial. But the weight hasn't bothered me with landscape. Here's a few things that the other cameras do not have. The Z9 is the only one to have GPS, and I love that. That means when I bring it into Lightroom, it's gonna tell me where I took the photo, making it easier to find my photos in certain locations. Another thing I love, especially when I'm taking night photography or astrophotography, is that you see this, there's off, and then there's on, and then there's this little light bulb that makes everything light up, and it even has lighted buttons. What a nice thing to have. That's beautiful, Nikon. Here's another point. It has two CF Express B cards. That's great when you're taking sports or wildlife pictures when you need these pictures to write really quickly, but for landscapes and travel it's not necessary and in fact it might impede you if you want an easy to use card reader, if you have to buy an SD card at the local pharmacy or camera shop they might not be as readily available as SD cards. Another thing you just saw me using is this two-way tilting screen so if you're trying to get a reflection you can put it down low. Oh you can dip your strap in a puddle. If you want to shoot in portrait orientation you can flip it this way and tilt it up so that you can still get low to the ground and see your shot. But might I mention let's look at this. This is kind of an interesting mechanism here. It functions, it works, it's not fully articulating. I can't take a video of myself or a selfie. It functions, it just seems a little, seems like a lot, right? There's a lot of little working parts there. I, I could see myself dropping it with it open and breaking it easily, but maybe that's the same for all of them. Just something that stuck out. I'm looking at these super expensive cameras, $4,000, $5,500, $6,500, that's an insane budget. And then these lenses are a couple thousand dollars. I understand that's not in everyone's budget. Not everyone is shooting professionally or has a YouTube channel where they review gear. Thankfully for you, there's KEH because you can get used gear there and get a great deal. They inspect everything and make sure it's in working order and then they give it a grade so it can be like new or it can be in excellent condition or you can get a bargain where maybe things aren't perfect but you're getting a steal and you're gonna have fun looking around and finding unique gear. You don't need the best and the latest to get a great landscape shot. I would recommend the Nikon D810. You'd still get amazing resolution at a better value. And you can get used glass that's also a better value because you don't need these zoom lenses. You can get an older prime with an adapter and save some money. And I recommend something like this or like this. So head to KEH, use our coupon code and get 5% off when you're buying used gear. If you wanna sell your gear to buy something new, you can get a 5% bonus if you use our code in the description. And KEH is also highlighting Earth Month this month because buying used gear is good for the planet. You're not throwing it out and buying new stuff all the time. It's not old gear just rotting somewhere. They're fixing it, they're reselling it, they're buying it from you. It's a good thing to do. As far as astrophotography goes, they all handled really well. You could focus on the stars and see them through the viewfinder or on the back of the screen. Okay, all of these cameras continue to function in complete darkness, but the Z9 has lighted buttons, so you win Z9. But the Sony might be the clear advantage for some people because they have dedicated astro lenses that are not yet available for the other systems. Some of you were asking me if the Sony had star eater issues. I have to take more photos to see if there's a problem there. The Sony Alpha One is the most expensive of the three at $6,500. It's got all of the bells and whistles. This shoots 30 frames per second raw. None of the other cameras do that, but is that really relevant for landscapes and travel? No, it's not. 
It does have some features that are nice though. It has uh, the CF Express cards that are A type. And one drawback to that that I don't like for travel is that the capacity is not as high as I would like. So we have a 160 gig card and right now I typically like like 256, but you can put an SD card in there. It's nice. You just flip it around in the card slot and you can shoot with SD. If you like that flippy screen for getting down low, you will be able to do that with one orientation, but you won't be able to flip it vertically in portrait orientation and do it again. It's the least versatile flip screen, but it still works. It also has these extra dials, so I can put my shutter delay on right here, and it makes it a bit more of a tactile experience. And if you know us, you know we like a tactile experience. One cool feature is that this is supposed to be capable of taking a 240 megapixel photo. I'm trying to find pixel shift in the menus. It's under camera, and then it's not under image quality, it's under drive mode. So if you're looking for it, that's where it is. Near self timer, bracket settings, and now pixel shift, multi-shoot. Let's turn that on. Are oh, you doing it? Pixel shift, multi-shooting. Engaged. I love it. I love the drama. Why am I nervous? It's like a big commitment, you know? So I went to check to see if my pixel shift shot came out, but it doesn't get processed in camera. So I actually, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. If you look at this example of pixel shift that I got, you can see that any part of the photo that was moving has some of this weird green fringe. That's expected. You expect it to not look very good. You might be able to blend in a single shot, but here, even where there isn't movement in the photo, you get some weird textures when you really zoom in. Um, you can see here on the rock, it's like a corduroy texture. It doesn't seem like more detail. Maybe this would work well in a more controlled environment. Okay, here you can see two photos. The one on the left is pixel shift. You can't tell the difference zoomed out. If we zoom in, you can see that the pixel shift on the left, maybe it kind of creates the appearance of more sharpness, but there's a lot of strange textures. The imperfect results could be caused by maybe a little movement in my tripod or the earth, if the ground shaking. Wow, that was dramatic. All of these cameras have screens that get washed out in the sun. And in the future, I'd like to see that not happen. I'd like to see, see something brighter so I can tell what my shot looks like. I end up looking through the EVF. It hasn't been as big of a, a problem, but I've noticed that the Z9 has the least nice EVF. Like you can actually see some pixelation. So you can see I switched to portrait orientation for the shot. And now I can't flip my screen anymore. It only goes out. Okay. Am I a little spoiled? Yes, but I'll have to bend my knees. And these knees just aren't what they used to be. The last thing I wanna talk about are the Wi-Fi apps because often when I'm traveling, I like to transfer my photos directly to my phone and share them, edit them in Lightroom Mobile. Um, I tried every app multiple times to make sure I had experience with each one. For the Nikon Z9, I had a difficult time connecting to Bluetooth. I tried five times. One time I connected to Bluetooth and then it dropped almost immediately. I did get it to connect to Wi-Fi. I was able to unload the photos successfully. The Nikon app was the best looking. I, it looks the best designed. It had clear instructions and everything looked really nice in that app. So I think that theirs is the best in that respect. I wanted to see how long it would take for me to transfer full size files to my phone. And for five pictures, it took the Nikon one minute and 53 seconds. But you can also choose smaller files and that's almost instant for five photos. Okay, so next is the Sony app. Um, this one I think had the least attractive user experience, but about the same usability as the others. Um, it was a little bit difficult to figure out the first time. I did not get Bluetooth to set up on this one either, but the Wi-Fi did connect successfully. The Sony took two minutes and 47 seconds to transfer five full-sized photos to my phone. Um, that's the longest time for all of these, but these files are a bit larger. Last is the Canon. It took me a few times to figure out. I only got the Wi-Fi to connect on this one as well. So I didn't get Bluetooth to connect on any of these. The connection failed a few times for the Canon um, and it was slow to reconnect. But once you got it working, the files did transfer and they took 
a minute and 45 seconds for those five full size photos. So I was wondering what it'd look like if I did use the smaller files and post them on social media. So I did a little experiment where I edited a raw, a full size raw photo and the smaller JPEG and put them on Instagram. And if you're just posting to Instagram, it seems like people can't tell much of the difference. Okay, so what are the final results here? If I had to choose, first I'm gonna say, you can't go wrong with any of these. I don't think there are any losers. The, the image quality was great. All of the cameras are great, but my, pick for landscapes and travel specifically would be the Canon R5 because it's the least expensive. It's $4,000 worth $6,500 for the Sony or $5,500 for the Z9. It's the same weight as the Sony. So it's a light compact system. The 70 to 200 is also the most compact of all of these systems. The Nikon is great, but it's more expensive and it's got this built-in battery so it's larger, it's heavier, and like I was saying, that weight does matter to me a bit. So Canon was the winner for me. What do you think? Which camera would you choose? Are the lighted buttons worth it for you if you're doing Astro all the time? Maybe the weight doesn't matter if you don't care about that? Would you choose Sony because you just like this system better? Or would you choose the same thing as me, Canon? Let me know in the comments down below. And don't forget that if you want to shop for used gear or sell your gear, check out KEH. You can do that and get a 5% bonus towards anything you sell there by using the code down below. Or you can get 5% off of anything you buy. Thank you, KEH, for making this video possible. Don't forget to like and subscribe because this is only the first series of tests I'm doing for these three cameras. Next, I'll be doing, I think, portraits, possibly, maybe wildlife. We'll see, but I'll have the next video out soon. Thanks so much.